A large screen in the FBI's operations center downtown showed the progress of Wicked Quick Kid in Supreme Destroyer. The small figure moved in a relentlessly unbroken pace across the crystalline desert under a golden sky and a blood red sun. Agent Arthur Dentillo, holding the tablet in front of him, saw the same thing on his screen at his location. The lone figure in black robes who, wherever he moved, was always at the center, anchoring this world's perspective. Rocky sand and shrub created a mirage of form and space, reaching all the way to the false horizon. It was the same view Nick Dunman had inside his headset, watching his own movements as if he were hovering outside of himself. Periodically, Wicked Quick Kid stepped past the picked over bones of dead beasts, their valuable cargo taken long ago. An AK-47 was slung across his back and lightly thudded against his black robes on every downstep. He could hear his heart beating, and he knew he was in the good feeling, the hour, hour and a half if he was lucky, when he vibrated at a pitch that blurred the lines between this world and that one. Wicked Quick Kid's shadow trailed over the sand as he crossed the Middle World Desert. Every few minutes he turned back to see if anyone was coming. Above him clouds flashed from dark green to shimmering gunmetal as Venoraptors plunged from the sky, firing their winged cannons at whatever strayed too close to the Citadel's walls. Ya Ikwadi, he said and waited for a response. Where'd you go, brothers? He tried again. But the FBI's signal jam had shut down his communications, both real world and inside the game, and there was silence. Wakwan Atif, he said, trying to sound unconcerned, using the Jamaican slang he'd picked up from the Bangladeshi Londoner. It was Atif who had introduced him to the brothers. It was Atif who performed his conversion. Fucking faggot bullshit, he said finally, and kneeled behind a rock to check his map. He was ascending one of the last dunes before reaching the staging area outside the citadel when he was attacked. His body tensed as he sucked in air, and instinct took over. Aki, they're on me, he said out loud a moment later. Sickly flares of orange-brown heaved up from the ground in the sound of tearing metal. The whole world came violently alive in a synthesthetic pulse. A spear tore into his shoulder, draining his life, while an arrow narrowly missed his head. He wheeled around and stabbed the nearest enemy with his dagger while firing his AK at the mass descending from the dune. Completely absorbed in the prosthetic sensorium, he felt only the faintest disturbance. A low, dissonant rumble when the battering ram struck the solid wood of his double locked door. He did not notice the police break into his room. Three men and one woman with FBI stenciled in yellow on the back of their blue jackets entered and one after the other assumed a look of mild amazement. Their suspect sat motionless in a cheap plastic office chair, his head tilted slightly back and covered by the white wraparound headset. There were nine people other than Dudman inside the bedroom, five of them with guns drawn but the 29-year-old had not moved an inch. There was no struggle when Agent Dentillo powered down the console and with a steadying hand on Dunman's shoulder, pulled off his headset and exposed him to the light. 
It would be almost 40 minutes before he showed a response of any kind to indicate that he knew he was no longer inside the game. A low groan when he glimpsed his reflection in the car window. In time, the carefully constructed element of surprise achieved during the initial arrest would be widely seen within the Bureau as the operation's only real success. Long after the Dunman case fell apart, the planners in the network exploitation team still spoke of it with pride. The FBI had timed it down to the minute. Dunman's parents, concerned for the welfare of their son, would have allowed the team into their home in the Boston suburbs. The target's room on the second floor was already marked by the sound insulating materials placed around its frame, supposedly for recording music. The FBI's Office of Network Exploitation tracked the exact coordinates of Dunman's avatar, Wicked Quick Kid, wherever he ventured in the five realms of Supreme Destroyer. As long as they had his location inside the game, they knew where he was on the outside. The tactical breach of the room was unnecessary, but Dantillo agreed to it as a concession to the state police. Okay, you get your overtime and budget line justification, Dantillo told the police lieutenant in their final planning meeting. But we only want one squad and no ballistic breach. That's not the approach we're going for here. You're the one say the target's a terrorist, the lieutenant shot back, visibly upset. This goes to shit, I got paperwork, says we were denied our request. You got paperwork, Dentillo acknowledged, pushing his chair back from the table and standing up. I'll keep that in mind. Once they were inside the house, the precise timing of the forced entry was based on the intersection of two vectors the target's position within the game, and the peak effect of his drug intake, a combined dosage of Adderall and Beltonin, commonly referred to as the gamer's cocktail. Taking it gave Dunman a window of enhanced focus and mental acuity, coupled with a perceptual state of mild synesthesia. Almost eight months earlier, Dentillo had received his introduction to the Bureau's new Psycho Barracks team, the latest addition to its growing Digital Operations Division. He wanted to understand how they could measure the drug's impact while Dunman was still inside the game. Same as if we were watching him in the real world, we measure his active responses, the team's lead doctor, Masha Vitrovsky, had explained to a skeptical Dentilla. When he passes the designated threshold in any seven of these nine criteria, it indicates a peak psychoactive state. This is his reaction time, she said, pointing to a screen on which a line skittered across a spectrum of colors. Dentillo stared at the screen and nodded, careful to avoid any meaningful glances that might betray his feelings, but by his furtiveness, marking his desire in the space between them. She pointed to another colored meter. Focus, how long he can engage in a given activity before having to stop or deviate. And so on, until she showed him all nine categories that comprised the standard psychobaric test. How much can you really know about a person from how they play a video game? Dentillo asked, squinting at the flickering screen. Psychobarics is a study of complex network systems. It's more like climate science than old-fashioned psychology, she said, shrugging in a way that made her ruffled blouse flutter, accentuating its old-fashioned modesty. And you know, a person cannot be understood only as a ledger of their actions. There is always the unconscious mind. I see, he said, nodding, pleasantly confused by what he saw as her choice to confide in him. Makes sense, thanks, 
He started towards the door, but she didn't move. She seemed to still be thinking about the question. It would depend on the game, really. How it was designed, for what reasons. If certain considerations went into creating the game, perhaps you could find out a great deal. She paused and pursed her lips before continuing. Really everything would depend on the game. He thought about that for weeks after, picturing the arch of her lips and the vowel sounds it made with her buried Russian accent that put a second Y in the middle of really. The day of the raid, that memory had just come back into his mind when the net call blared over the radio. It was 11.37 when the target psycho barracks hit green and the second phase of the operation went into effect. By 1400, they had him in custody downtown. The room inside the federal building where Dunman was left to wait looked more like an office than an interrogation facility. Two men entered. My name is Agent Dentillo, said the short man in the dark blue suit. This is my partner, Agent Mitchum. He pointed an open hand to his left at a man with a similar build, but a less impressive suit. They were both short and compact, but Mitchum, not yet in his fifties, and with a full head of hair where Dentillo's had started thinning, still looked older. He seemed to be receding in his suit, Dunman observed while Dentillo bulged out in his. They sat down at the table across from him. Do you know why you're here, Nick? No. It occurred to him how strange it was that he had given so little thought to the matter. But before he could really consider this, he was seized with terror. He must have downloaded something off of one of the torrenting sites. One of the pornographic archives he had downloaded on faith, foolishly trusting the message board recommendations. Thousands of movies, far too many to check all the titles. He wasn't a pedophile, but who would believe that? Who would believe that he didn't know what he had in his own possession? It looks like there's something you want to tell us, Agent Dentillo said, placing his palm down on the table in front of him. Let's start with this, Nick, the other man, Mitchum said, speaking for the first time. When did you first get interested in terrorism? Oh, tension in his body loosed. Oh, it's that. Well, Dunman said, sitting up in his seat and exhaling with relief. I've been interested a long time, actually. Then there was a long silence. Fragments of his past formed in his thoughts like images projected on a fog. He considered what to tell them. By 22, his life had stopped moving forward into new experiences and begun to empty out. He spent listless days in his room or in a mild panic waiting to get back to it. Once he got to sleep, the nights were never long enough. The moment he applied effort to something, it came to seem pointless or beneath him. He lost track of time in the game world. Savage figures camped in his mind at the edge of a wilderness. He was alone, but it was never fully dark. A screen was always on. It wasn't the politics of terrorism that had interested him. He was drawn to the videos. It started after he dropped out of college for the second time and returned home at 25. In a state of almost hallucinatory despair, he had seized on the idea of joining the Army Special Forces. Overnight, it became an obsession. He saw clearly for the first time in years First, the difficult training would give him an exorcism. Then, once his spirit was purified, the elite fraternity would give him a life. 
This lasted for almost five months before he gave up on it. His drug prescriptions would be a problem. His aptitude was high enough, but he found it more difficult than he'd imagined to meet even the minimum physical standards. After a period of emotional convalescence during which his parents had begged him to seek treatment and threatened to have him forcibly committed, he finally saw a way out. He would join the Kurds. Fighting for the Kurdish force would give him his start, a resume he could build on as a mercenary. He spent hours reading about the Kurds in threads online and talking with other prospective volunteers on Reddit. He practiced his tactics and radio talk with a clan of Kurdish patriots inside Supreme Destroyer. None of them spoke Kurdish, but it was close enough for now. And he watched hours and hours of combat footage, taking advantage of the feature inside the game that let players watch internet videos through the eyes of their avatar. To his and Wicked Quick Kid's surprise, the combat videos were slow. Even when the shooting started, it was filmed in a way that seemed almost disinterested, with no sense of how to foreground the action. So he started looking for better, more intense videos, trading with other collectors using the secure file transfer caves inside the game. And that was how he met Atif. The thought of Atif stirred him. He looked up at the two agents across the table and wondered how much time had passed. I'm not talking until I see my lawyer, Dunman said, seeming for the first time not only fully conscious, but rather self-assured. That's your right, Nick, but it may take a while. So why don't you think things over? Maybe ask yourself, if we have you here, how much do we know? Probably a lot. But you're a smart guy. I think you'll figure that out. Dunman rose. Dentillo rose, left Dunman with Mitchum, and went down to the third floor to the offices of digital operations to see Slotik. Two minutes. The simulation's almost finished, Agent Slotik said in his vague middle European accent without looking up from his screen. Shut the door and have a seat. The new accommodations aren't bad. Dentillo shut the door behind him and looked around. The first thing he noticed was the basket of multicolored coffee pods offering a variety of flavors next to the sleek single-use machine. Budget cuts had forced his own department, full of old-fashioned field agents, to revert to the unsanitary practice of a shared drip coffee pot the kind that accumulated strange films and sludges, but had clearly spared the Office of Digital Operations. Under the hum of the server stacks in the temperature-controlled environment, he pulled out his phone and scrolled through old text messages to calm himself. Do you know what Henri Bergson said? Slotik broke in. Dentillo had worked with Slotik long enough to know better than to ask whether he meant Bergson from payroll or to ask anything at all. He said nothing. Another one trying to undo Kant. A new dualism, but really multiplicity. Slotik looked up from his screen. Ah, finished. Now we'll see what this Dunman will do. Dentillo put his phone away. The universe is a machine for the making of gods, okay? This is what Bergson said. The universe is a machine for the making of gods, but it's wrong, totally wrong. Dentillo crossed the room. Richard, I need the vector's report. We still have him in custody. Bergson had it wrong. He handed Dentillo the stack of freshly printed paper. It is the other way. The machine is a god for the making of universes. The future of America depends on this. The whole world depends. But we have to save America first, and they won't listen to me because of the accent. You know, 
I hear myself. I've seen the old movies. I know how it sounds. Sinister. He raised his eyebrows in a gesture of, but what can you do? So it has to be you, Agent Dentillo. You're a good American agent from New Jersey. You have to explain what is happening. Dentillo took the papers and headed towards the door. The machine is a god for the making of universes. This is reality. Slotik's voice picked up as Dentillo got further away. You know, we upload all these reports so everyone can print from their own office. I have only so much paper here. Turning into the hallway, Dentillo made no effort to close the door behind him.